طبعا آه لما نتكلم عن when we talk about multi ligament we have uh, a dilemma yeah it's easy to deal with one ligament alone but when you have more than one ligament and it became a complex it is uh, difficult and it's a dilemma whether you treat conservatively or operative and if you want to operate when to operate uh, do you repair the ligament or do you reconstruct and what uh, graft you use and how you repair partial or total do you fix it all at one time or you delay them uh, whether you do as they said acute fixation or you can uh, wait for a period before you do it and how you mobilize them so these are the questions then when we ask ourselves so what is the multi-ligament uh, knee injury when we talk about multi-ligament it's at least two ligaments of the major four which is the anterior cruciate or posterior cruciate or posterior medial complex or posterior lateral complex and uh, it is usually a challenging uh, problem uh, where to start and where to end and uh, when we talk about two terms that they all come together whether a knee dislocation versus a multi-ligament knee injury uh, knee dislocation often result in multi-ligament injury but some of the multi-ligament uh, are not knee dislocation so what are we talking about you're talking about you can have one ligament injured and consider as a knee dislocation especially if you have uh, injury to the nerves or injury to the artery where multi-ligament can happen without these injuries. So they are not considered as a new dislocation. So how we classify these injuries? Because when you classify them, uh, it's always a good to analyze how you manage them. And uh, I remember one of my mentors, he said, a classification should be in a way to grade the severity and uh, prepare you for the management or decide the management scale. So, uh, Schenck in 94 uh, paced an anatomical pattern of the ligament, uh, came up with the knee dislocation uh, classifications, where make it a saccade, which is a knee dislocation one, when there is one cruciate ligament, maybe there is a collateral ligament, and uh, two, when there is two ligaments, ACL and BCL. If there is ACL, BCL, and MCL, it is uh, 3M. And if it's a uh, uh, lateral or uh, lateral collateral, it's uh, uh, KD3L. Then when you have four ligament injury, uh, then it is four. And if there is a fracture or bulging piece of bone, with this, then it is five. So it depends, if you look at this the classification, start with a simple one and go to the severity. So the more complex, the more uh, uh, injury uh, the knee has, the higher the number of the classification. And when we talk about injury again, we need to know about the spectrum of injury. When we talk about spectrum, we talk about how uh, energy uh, used in, in causing this injury. If you look at most of the motor vehicle accident, uh, it can cause a high energy trauma uh, and uh, injure the knees or sometimes fall from height, uh, where sport injuries like a football injury is considered as a low energy and usually split almost 50-50 with more of a, a higher uh, energy like a 51-49 according to the statistics. This is, was okay, but uh, recently with the change in uh, diet uh, habit, we start to have some other injuries that uh, consider as ultra low velocity trauma, which is uh, the morbid obesity patient. And these are totally different uh, 
problem because it's usually associated with the vascular and uh, nerve injury and it's associated with higher uh, complication rate due to the uh, morbid obesity and anesthesia issues and wound healing is the big issues. So then we come to how we evaluate these patients. We need to have a detailed physical examination. We need to get stress images. We need to get uh, MRI. Um, certain cases, if we think there's a pulse injury, uh, vascular injury, we need to do an angiograph or uh, uh, especially if the API uh, is less than 0.9. And uh, we have to understand there are certain marker for injuries like a posterior lateral corner. They only 28% happen alone. So majority happen with other injury. So you need to be hyper vigilant when you assess these patients. So you need to go for uh, check if there is any dislocation, you need to reduce it immediately. You need to evaluate the neurovascular status and you need to splint the limb. You don't want that knee to be re-injured again just from transporting the patient between uh, the emergency room and to the to the OR or to the radiology room. So you need to make sure that they are splinted and protected. And in acute trauma, we usually, uh, especially in high energy, we have to assist these patients with ATLS protocol. As you know, uh, life before limp. And as I said, if we have a uh, API less than 0.9, we need to make sure that we process, uh, we do an angiogram to see where is uh, the injury in the vessels. Maybe he has an antimal injury. Most likely uh, these cases can have a popliteal injury because that's around the knee. It's between 23 to 32%. Also, uh, it's a common to have an injury to the common peroneal nerve and about 14 to 40 percent in different studies with average of 35 percent. And, uh, and as I said earlier, in the ultra low velocity, we have to remember that they associate with both nerve and vascular injury and higher complication even after treatment. So when we talk about vascular, we need to understand well that uh, how we address these patients. Yes, sometimes we need to dress uh, multi-ligament acutely with the dressing all the ligament, but if you have a vascular injury, then limb is before the function. And uh, Stanner, James Stanner came up with a protocol with his group in 2004 uh, for monitoring vascular injury where first we need to revascularize the, the knee put an external fixator to protect it because it will take very long time to, to do all this ligament at once. And by that time, you know, ischemia will happen. So you need to go quick and prompt. You put the external fixator, revascularize, and maintain the knee in reduced position. And then once the soft tissue healed and soft tissue relaxed, you can come back later on in two to six weeks and maybe you can put the patient in a hinge process and address him on the later stage because now we secure his vascularity. So when we talk about uh, how we acutely treat these patients, we need to look at multi-ligament associated with life threatening, whether it's yes or no. If it's yes, then we have to do emergent treatment for damage control orthopedics. We need to stabilize the patient and we can address them at the later stage. If it is not life threatening, we need to check for his neurovascular status. If it's okay, we need to check the vascularity. If the vascularity is compromised, then we need to assess it with doubler or API and maybe angiogram and then reduce the dislocation and the OR and the counsel, the prognosis depends on the uh, treatment of the vascularity. If there is no vascular compromise, then you can reduce it and fix the fracture if there's a fracture or address the ligament depends on the timing uh, you, uh, you have. 
let us assume that on the vascular we came up later on to fix him or if the patient was missed through the 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 cues and went into a chronic uh, multiligament status uh, we have to again have a detailed evaluation of the physical exam mri stress radiology to identify all injured uh, uh, structure. We need to assess if there is a cartilage injury or meniscus injury, and these are, should be diagnosed and treated concurrently. In addition, we have to assess the long axis radiograph of the lower extremity and should be obtained to assess if there is a virus or a valgus alignment. Uh, recently, I had a patient who uh, keep uh, he presented to me a uh, few years after his injury, and we found that he has a fracture that healed into uh, a vulgus tibia with uh, reverse uh, a slope of the tibia. And that was missed by most of the evaluation because they thought it's just he has an ACL injury, and uh, that's a ligament we need to fix, and we didn't need to worry about the alignment. So addressing this with a small detail, uh, uh, hypervigilance to the details, it's very important when you deal with multi-ligament uh, knee injury. And if there is a virus malalignment to present a patient with a chronic PLC injury, we need some time to correct his osteotomy uh, prior to the uh, reconstruction. Uh, a high tibial osteotomy, open wage can correct it, and uh, maybe we didn't need to do a PLC reconstruction. So, when we assess PCL injury, we need to assess uh, what type of PCL injury, grade one, two, or three. If it is very displaced posteriorly with a stress image compared to the other limb, then yes, uh, we need to address it. If it's a grade one or maybe two, maybe you can treat it conservatively. It depends on, on the situation. Unless it is with multiple injured knee, then we need to uh, assist each ligament alone. Again, when we talk about con, uh, committant injury, we talk about high incidence of meniscal and uh, focal cartilage. It's about 15 to 55 over and the cartilage injury is about 28 to 48. The common perineal nerve, you can see it here, and the uh, arrow, it shows that uh, uh, this is patient, we did a posterior lateral corner, and we have to identify the uh, common perineal nerve prior to, uh, uh, to anything around the posterior lateral corner, otherwise we risk an injury to the nerve. So, in summary, about the chronic uh, multi-ligament, we need to see stable condition. We need to assess if it's a both crochet or it's a single crochet with collaterals or it's more, and we address each one alone according to its best way of treatment. So, uh, this is will raise the question whether, well, as we said, did we uh, do we operate or not operate? I think this is uh, most of the study shows that there's improved outcome with the uh, uh, surgical group as compared to the non surgical group. Mostly, non surgical cause of poor, uh, poor outcome and functionality of the patient is affected. Functional rehabilitation after surgery was the most important positive prognostic factors. And uh, and in the rare occasions, such as an advanced age, immobility and comorbidity, and uh, then maybe we can consider non-surgical treatment. So it depends on the assessment of the patient, and uh, at some point, it uh, depends on the age, we can address it differently. If we repair the ligament or we reconstruct, so the studies by Mariani, a patient with repaired cruciate ligaments, first of all, have a higher rate of reflection deficit, more than 
higher rate of posterior instability, lower rate of return to pre-injury activity and level, and higher reoperation rate in the patient with PLC treated with repair. And anatomical construction have a better and improved outcome. So from this study, uh, it's recommended that I don't think we need to worry about much repairing the, the ligaments itself. I think we should uh, reconstruct it, uh, which give a better, uh, better result and a better our patient outcome. Timing of the surgery. Now, uh, this is another debate uh, from the dilemmas we talk about early. So there is no consensus when it's uh, considered acute versus uh, chronic uh, uh, repair or uh, reconstruction. Uh, some, some papers talk about uh, acute considering the first three weeks and others goes up to six weeks. So let's say from three to six weeks, uh, still consider as an acute repair and more than six weeks, then we talk about chronic repair. And acute treatment important in case, especially if there is a bony involved, avulsion where we need to fix it immediately. And uh, that's, we can take the opportunity to address the treatment of the patient at all. And acute uh, treatment of the injured structure is also can facilitate their rehab and shorten their time. And uh, stage in the recurrence can alter joint kinematics and can increase the risk of graft failure. The exception is in high energy trauma, surgery might be delayed due to the soft tissue, as I mentioned, due to the vascularity, or there is a nerve injury that we need to extend and fix uh, the, the limb, uh, as we mentioned before, and then we can come later. So every rules has its own exception. So how we, now we go to the surgical part. Now, what we do? So we have to think and plan where we then put our tunnels on the bone because the bone has a limited stock and we need to be hyper vigilant and try to plan our tunnels. So if we don't think about them, then we might have uh, a tunnel convergence and they open to each other and cause risk of graft failure and instability. So the next step is tension sequence. Which one we do first? So we do ACL first, do we do the PCL? So Greg Finale and Markov talking about doing the PCL first because that will restore the central pivot of the knee and also it will reduce the tibial step off and uh, they will reduce the graft forces. And sorry, will restore the graft forces uh, by doing the PCL first. Then the second question, what is next? Do we do an ACL or go to the PLC? And this is another uh, paper by Wontroff and Abrad in 2002 it said, PLC prior to the ACL, usually advisable to avoid external tibial rotation at the time of the fixation. And that will make the knee maltract. So we need to address it prior to go for the ACL. So using that, we formulate uh, a tension sequence where we go with the PCL first, we tension it at 90 degree, then we tension the FCL or the PLC, uh, the FCL part of the, uh, the PLC, where at 20 to 30 degree with the knee flexion and slightly valgus force. PLC structure, at, we tighten at 60 degree of flexion and then neutral rotation. Then we come to the ACL, which is near full extension. I usually do it around 20 degree of lack of full extension. And then at the end, we go to the posterior medial corner. So these sequences secure for you the proper tightening and sequence of uh, fixation and uh, give you the result you, you're looking for. 
So, we know now the sequence, we know what to do. Now, we need to go to the surgical technique. We have to have major point, which is the patient selection. We have to make sure. We need to know that there is injury more than one ligament. We need to have an active patient without major comorbidity. We need to have detailed assessment. This is your checklist. You need to have a detailed assessment of all injuries. We need to aim for surgical treatment of all injuries and structure in acute setting. We need to understand that obese patients have higher complication. And uh, as we mentioned before, delayed treatment. So you have to rehearse these points all the time you address a patient with uh, and you can see I'm stressing this point again and again because it's very important. So, and you have to understand. I'm not going to go on how you will do the bursilateral uh, corner. You can see this is a laparotomy technique of double bundle for the PLC. And this is the MCL again with the double bundle technique where you get a symmetry and hamstring and you fix it at the uh, superficial MCL and around the medial tubercle. Okay. Then another tips and tricks, as I said, patients should be positioned to have a full flexion and extension at the knee. If you can see this patient, uh, we examine him, we can, we can put him in full, a full flexion. Now we have, we examine his knee on the table. And if you look at that uh, uh, upper picture, you can see he has an extended rotation, which is indicate that he has a posterior corner as compared to the left side. So we have to we have to write down in your in your board how many grafts you need. That you need to plan it before. If you don't have enough, you need to go and get an allograft. So you need to know how many grafts you need for each reconstruction. And you need to write the steps of the surgeries for your team, your nurses in the operating room. They need to know what to start with. And usually, you need to have exploration for the collateral ligament, why you need to start there. Because if you start with the intraarticular uh, ligament first, then there will be an extra position of the fluid and then doing the approach, especially for posterior lateral corner, it would be extremely difficult to visualize, identify the nerves and the tendon. So do your open procedure first, explore it, then go to the arthroscopy because the arthroscopy is easy, you used to. So then you have to plan and you have to know the tunnel position all the tunnels should be placed in the anatomic footprint of the ligament being reconstructed. And you have to avoid, again, tunnel convergence. Sometimes I use the acorn uh, reamers to smoothen the edge. So when the graft slide in, then they are not injured at the time of insertion. And then fixation, as we said, PLC first, sorry, PCL first, then PLC, then ACL, and finally posterior medial corner. And you have to see these sutures. You can see them thrown everywhere. You have to know each one is your graft passer and which graft you're going to pass through this, uh, these sutures because it's kind of sometimes confused. This patient has a, an incision here, and I will bring it to you later on. And so we use the traumatic incision for our advantage. So sometime. So this is a fixation of the, you see, as I said, you can see here, this is how it was before. And uh, this is, this is the, uh, the knee afterward. You can see uh, this patient, we did multiple ligament. You can see ACL, PCL solid. And then I come from there. You can try to do external rotation for a dial test to see it doesn't rotate. 
uh, doesn't rotate uh, and uh, like here. So you know that you secure your fixation in the operating room. So when we two, we, then we are going to go over a special one by one. Uh, to PCL, if you look at the PCL, you go, go to the, you have to use an image when you do it and uh, to, uh, to make sure that your drill in the right, uh, right position. And this is uh, where I mark my footprint area. That's a remnant of the PCL is there. Then I remove the remnant. Then I go with the uh, scope in the, in the notch to establish the posterior uh, medial portal and the direct vision. And this I use uh, usually patient in the log holder, so it's 90 degree, and I go with, uh, the, or if I didn't use the 90 degree, especially in this case, because I need to dress multiple ligament, then I flex the knee and I do it. So now we have a cannula posteriorly, and then I go with the shaving of the PCL footprint. And uh, I'm looking from the anterior portal, and I'm shaving from the posterior medial portal. And you can see that the back of the shaver to the soft tissue behind me, so I'm protecting the vascularity and the soft tissue behind by the back of the shaver. So this is the tunnel uh, I do to freehand for the, you get my patient in 90 degree, five millimeter from the superior margin and eight millimeter from the, from the anterior margin. And I drill my footprint area, which we marked before. It depends on the size of the graft. My graft here was 10 millimeter. So, and you don't, don't worry about shaving a little bit of the edge here. This is not articulating part of the cartilage. You need to clean all these bony debris. This is now I'm looking from the posterior medial, and this is my guide uh, from the anterior portal. Now I switch, I went to the anterior portal with the camera. I know where I keep my guide, and I will drill front to back. You can see that's a drill bit coming. And then I put uh, the curate from the uh, medial and I drill with the tibial reamer. So then I usually put a shaver to clean the, the, the body debris. And then this is will came a suture passer. And then I grip it from the front back again. And we connect it from the, the tibia and the femoral tunnel as one. And then this is a, a shaver for, or smoother for the tunnel. So the graft will not have. Sometimes I make the trocar as an elbow to push the graft out of the, um, the tibial tunnel. I usually use BTV for PCL or recently I'm using uh, hamster, uh, sorry, quadriceps tendon, uh, then I usually fix it with interference screw anteriorly. So, and here you can see I'm looking from the posterior median and the probe is coming from the, and the screw is coming from the anterior to posterior and it is at the cortical fixation, so I know that my fixation is good and solid. Okay, so most operatively, I usually, for multi ligament, I usually protect it, uh, range of motion, 
And then I progress with weight very accordingly. I work on activation of the quadriceps and patella mobility. Rehabilitation can take from nine to 12 months for multi-ligament. I use a brace during the activity for the first year uh, of returning to activity. Then when we, we did all this procedure, uh, we need to know also the outcome well, after this multi-ligament. It's not just doing the surgery for the sake of surgery. We all, as we said, we need to make sure that we improve in the patient outcome. And uh, that's our aim and all our management. The study shows that there is a high prevalence of radiographic osteoarthritis ranging from 23 to 87 in different papers. And certain factors that correlate with poor outcome include high energy trauma, uh, there is a medial side injury repair, age above uh, 30, and uh, concomitant uh, cartilage injuries. So in, they lost their cartilage and combined medial and lateral meniscal uh, tear, which is the meniscus is the shock absorber of the knee. So that's expedite uh, the aging process and arthritis in this knees. So I will share this case with you. I, I show you some of the picture early, but this is a 22 years old uh, young boy uh, involved in a car accident, rollover, and he brought to the trauma, uh, trauma hospital, and he have this X-ray, which shows uh, an open uh, medially, which is indicate for a complete rupture of the uh, MCL. So. If you look at this MRI, this is his initial MRI. And I will go, you can see everything is torn here. You can see it's all edema. And this is another one. You can see MCL is gone, maybe bony bruise, uh, still lateral. And this is here, you can see that's all uh, compression, no ACL, no PCL. And we go back to this one. Look here, all that MBFL is gone. So this, uh, so this young chap have ACL, PCL, posterior lateral corner, MCL, and medial patellofemoral ligament tear. And he was treated uh, Unfortunately, he was treated with a cast. For uh, he has no vascular, no neurological injury. So, I, which all agree that's not acceptable these days for 22 years old, high energy, and there is no vascular compromise. Uh, from that algorithm, we said we should aim for fixation of all his. So he presented to me a month after uh, his uh, uh, his uh, injury with a range of motion 20 to 60. Now we have a difficult issue. We have, a, uh, we have uh, an injury. We have a stiffness as well. So would you operate and try to fix his ligament now since still four to six weeks with his stiffness? I didn't think anyone will do any surgery in this. It's, just, it's, just, it's a crime to operate with this range of motion. So what we did, we put him in extensive physiotherapy for about two months uh, from January until March. And uh, he was injured uh, around the 1st of December last year. So this is, we, uh, you can see that his knee was bending easily. Uh, and this is his examination. Uh, 
here. This is external rotation. And uh, yeah, the A was good range of motion when we operate on him. That's okay. When okay, uh, there's something hang, so I will just finish uh, with the, I will read with the game. Uh, okay. One minute. Okay, uh, I think I had a glitch here. So basically, as we show you early, we uh, we did we operated him, and uh, we did the we went through a different approach. We use his cut wound, and we if you look at here, this is a suture for the posterior lateral corner, the FPL from here to there to pass the graft. Then we have a graph that goes through for replacing the popliteus from the tibia uh, and to the femur. And uh, we had a different uh, uh, procedure here. So this is, we end up with him after we stabilize all the ligament. Uh, it shows a chronic reconstruction uh, but uh, at the end, uh, we had a solid, and you can see ACL and BCL, they're solid. And we also reconstruct his MBFL. We take some graft from the other side. I try always to use autograft. You can see here on the left side, we take his hamstring. 
So we were lucky, we take his hamstring from here, we take the quads to them, and we take the hamstring from this side as well uh, to reconstruct his ligaments. So we had about five ligaments that we used for his uh, sake. So with this, uh, we come to conclusion. So when you talk about multi-ligament, it is, of course, it's a complex, uh, complex uh, condition, it needs uh, proper planning, it needs uh, an understanding of uh, the, uh, the sequence of event from the time you address the patient in the emergency room, or if he came as a chronic in your clinic, proper assessment, uh, then proper planning, interoperative uh, sequence, and planning your tunnel, planning your sequence of tensioning and uh, make sure that you have enough graft to address uh, the patient uh, and it will need from nine to 12 month rehabilitation so it's not gonna uh, it's not going to be an easy ride for you or for the patient uh, not through the procedure or after the procedure and as we know, the vascular and uh, neurological injury at the, time of the in at the time of the accident is very high. And depends on the uh, energy type, uh, then we know uh, most of the sequence of the event, how it would be. So if it's a car accident, then we know what it is. If it's a, a football player or injured playing soccer, that's a different issue. With this, I came to a conclusion of my presentation. If you have any question. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Said and Tani for this informative presentation. Now we come to the question part. Any questions from the audience? We are waiting for questions. Any questions? Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Wa alaikum as Dr. Muhammad. How are you? Allah is very good. 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 Thank you very much for the informative presentation. It's very concise and very practical to the point. Uh, but uh, I have one question. Uh, do you always do your multi-ligamentous uh, knee injuries in a single session, or you prefer to do uh, stage procedures at some times? And, and, and what's usually the indication for these stage staged procedures? Well, I usually like to do them all at once. Uh, the reason uh, it is... Uh, it is easy to start a rehab uh, financially also for the patient because they're going to pay twice for the procedure if they take them as a stage. And if you develop, develop your protocol to accommodate them properly, then single, single uh, stage uh, with, you have to understand there's a, if you're gonna use a tourniquet, you are limited to time. So if you if you wanna do it, you have to work with your anesthetist. I have a very nice anesthetist. We work with hypotensive anesthesia. So we drop the main arterial pressure to around 60 to 70. So and we work with minimum uh, blood loss and we give some transamic acid. So I can operate for five to six hours multi-ligament uh, without tourniquet, and I'm fine with this. Uh, the moment you start using tourniquet, then you are limited with the, with the time. And if you're going to use a tourniquet, you can use it. It's fine. But you have to remember that after two hours or so, you need to stop the tourniquet, maybe for half an hour, 20 minutes. You can do something else, or you can go have a coffee and come back 
or you go to the biological break or anything. So you can stage, but you have to plan your day. And that's the most important. You, you don't come as if you're coming for a meniscectomy. No, it's more than a meniscectomy. It's a big, you need, the, you need to clear your list after this. This is a full day case because you need your mental strain as well as your physical strain. And sometimes you have some uh, unpleasant uh, surprises in the surgery. Sometimes you find a uh, pocket handle meniscus, uh, medial meniscus that, that need repair, and uh, a lateral meniscus that need repair, a road tear. Sometimes you find complex finding uh, in, in the surgery that make it very, very lengthy to do it at, at one setting. I think it is also a, a cooperative team. You, you have to uh, God assistant, he, he understand you, God nurse, God team. Uh, to do it at once is very difficult. I, I know. Uh, uh, I used to do it to stage. Uh, but if you want to do it to stage, I will go with the PCL and posterior lateral corner at once. And I've done that before. And then I come back for the ACL and another session. VLC uh, and uh, and uh, uh, PCL, if you don't do them together, there's a high chance of failure. Yeah. So these are two has to be done together when you operate on them. Yes, yeah, so that's what we have. Are using, uh, sorry, Dr. We are using with the PCL and BLC, and then the other session we are doing the, the ACL. Okay, Dr. Muhammad? Now we have many questions. Professor Said, how to accurately do femoral tunnel for PCL? Well, I look from, uh, as I said, I put the knee in 90 degree. I look at the footprint from the previous ACL, and I mark it. And if you go there, you're fine. You, Sometimes if you go to the anterior lateral and the posterior medial bundle, and you mark in between. You, I take the center point, and most of the time it is at 90 degree, it is about eight millimeter from the anterior cortex and about five millimeter from the superior cortex, uh, superior articular cartilage, I mean, not cortex. So it is, it is always consistent at that point. So if you go with the footprint area, that's it. You don't, you don't, need, you don't need any measurement because people are different. There's somebody who's bigger, there's somebody who's small. So one millimeter here and there, it doesn't matter. You go with the footprint area. Yes. Another question. What's the best time to operate in multi-ligamentous injured patient? I usually do it within a week. You wait for a week because you want the soft tissue to heal. Otherwise, if you do an operation at that time, you will see a lot of fluid extravasation, and that might increase the chance of compartment syndrome during the procedure. So I usually waited for a week to allow it to, to the soft tissue to heal before I operate. And then you can have your plan, your vascular surgeon can, or vascular team can assist, and you can, you can, if it is, if there's no vascular or neurological, uh, I just put them in a, in a splint. Another question. Uh, when do you start post-operative rehabilitation after the single stage operation? I usually start immediately. But it depends on what you mean by immediately. The first few months, I didn't do much of range of motion, just little range of motion as much as they can. But most of the physiotherapy initially is to address the pain, address the soft tissue, and the patellar mobilization. So these are the things I look for in my initial uh, part and reducing the swelling and uh, maintaining the dynamic of the blood flow on the legs. So these are essential in the physiotherapy. The range of motion, I wait for a few weeks. Yeah, another question. Did the first patient you presented had a wound from the trauma? And if so, when did you operate? 
You don't fear of infection in such case? Well, this patient was injured uh, on the 7th of, of December last year, 2019. And I operated on him because he presented me late. He, I operated on him on the 4th of March. So almost three months uh, because he came to me stiff. Uh, and uh, it was an injury from the, surgery, from the accident itself, which was uh, cleared and which was uh, a stitch. So instead of me making another scar to address his MBFL or address my tunnels, uh, I used the incision for my advantage. I just like, as if I unzip his uh, scar and I reclose it again. Do you operate uh, on cases with uh, stiff knee if the patient was neglected no. and he has a stiff knee? No. You don't operate, of course. I don't. I wouldn't. Because yeah. if you do it, uh, it's, a, it's a killer for you and the patient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another question. What are the long-term results and does it differ between one stage and multiple stages surgery? Well, I did see uh, most of the recent study and the short-term study now, it's uh, preferring the acute uh, uh, for uh, all-in-one uh, one stage surgery, uh, especially uh, uh, most of the recent, uh, recent paper uh, talking about it. So uh, I just want to remember the name. Uh, uh, the paper by Abdul Fazil, uh, Abdul Fazil, Bakr Farid, and the group from Iran, they talk about short term to mid term outcome in a single stage reconstruction of multiple. And they, they, this is published recently in 2018. We're talking about single stage uh, provide acceptable outcome, uh, but it needs to be done by a team that uh, able to address it. So it depends on your team. It depends on your setup in the operating room. You cannot go and do uh, any procedure if the team is not supporting you. If you're, uh, you cannot uh, yeah, take a risk with patient. If situation demand the two stage, why not? I've done two stages and they're they're doing extremely well. I, I don't see any problem with this. You need to do what you need to do. Thank you so much for the uh, time you spend with us. Thank you, Professor. It was an honor to us. Thank you. Shukran. Uh, there is one question apparently here, different source of a graft for each ligament. Well, I use hamstring for PLC and yeah. for ACL. I use uh, quads for uh, PTB or uh, sorry for PTB and quads. I use them for uh, the PCL. Uh, for hamstring, I can use also uh, CMT. Depends on the situation. Usually, hamstring can heal by himself by the time you operate at, at three months. And this this patient had his MCL healed. Uh, so I just put an internal brace as an augment uh, for his MCL. Yes, my, the final question and the last question from Dr. Rami Sharif. When do you say, if ever, that this injury is not reconstructable? If the patient, if the patient is old and the patient has arthritis, so maybe he is not a material for uh, a ligament reconstruction, maybe it's easy to do a total knee for him. So it depends on the situation, depends on the patient, depends on the injury itself. So these are decisions. Other than that, if he's young and uh, uh, we can always reconstruct it. If the cartilage is good, if the meniscus is good, these are, you know, the knee is the cartilage. If the cartilage is damaged, the knee is gone. Again, thank you so much. نأمل إن إحنا نرى حضرتك تاني معنا في الكورس في الكورس في التروما إن شاء الله يا فندم. إن شاء الله. شاكرين أفضل حضرتك وشرفتنا ونورتنا بروفيسور سعيد. الله يخليك تسلم. تعداء بلقاء حضرتك اليوم.
ماشي. الله يبارك فيك شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا اخينا الفاضل شكرا جزيلا اخي دكتور محمد ايوه ازيك حضرتك ازيك يا حبيبي وحشنا 